All right, it's uh, 426, not 420. So, sorry, bad joke. Uh, last panel of DockerCon, last thing of DockerCon, and it's, oh, we're not at DockerCon? Oh my <laughs> God, I'm, I, I, okay. KubeCon, yeah, you see, this is what I'm already thinking ahead to, KubeCon, but what, anyways. Uh, just a public service announcement, for those of you that haven't uh, looked at your Google News yet or opened your Twitter accounts, reset your password since this is a security session. Because uh, this has nothing to do with this panel directly, but uh, your passwords were stored in the clear and somebody might have they them. They weren't so, stored in the clear. Uh, they were <laughs> not encrypted. So yeah, without bcrypt, et cetera, et cetera. But you can read about it online, so reset it. Or more importantly, if you have not implemented uh, login authentication or two-factor authentication, whether it's Twitter or anything else, I think that's probably the most important thing you can do to improve uh, security for anything. Uh, we're not gonna talk about two-factor authentication in this panel, so don't worry about that. Uh, though I'm a big fan of it. Uh, there's lots of security, or has been many security talks uh, at this particular conference. Uh, all of our panelists uh, here today have had at least one or more talks. Uh, probably a few of you in the audience have been to one or more talks. Uh, so there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that are right uh, with the Kubernetes and cloud native ecosystem. There's a lot of things that are, are wrong. Uh, in this panel, we're going to talk about what's right, what's wrong, uh, what's missing, what's next. And more importantly, whatever questions you have, uh, because uh, this is what it's all about, is talking and collaboration, et cetera. So I'm just going to go uh, uh, down the list here, uh, down the line. And if each of you could just introduce yourselves just for uh, a minute or two uh, and tell us all about your projects. And we'll start with uh, Justin, who runs the, uh, the Update Framework project. Hi, yes. I, I'm Justin Kapos. I'm a professor at NYU. And I've been working along with uh, my team on the update project uh, for actually about nine years now. Um, we were have been excited to work with the Docker community and others on that project. Uh, we also do a lot with, uh, more recently, with software supply chain security. So you might have seen uh, one of my developers, Lucas, who's here in the audience, um, give a, a talk uh, on Grafeus and Intoto uh, to learn more about our Intoto in system. So thank you. And hi, folks. I'm Andrew. Uh, I work at Cytale, which is the, uh, I, I guess, the, the sponsor company behind Spiffy. Uh, Spiffy is a new project that just joined the CNCF that aims to provide dial tone infrastructure for uh, authentication for developers. Uh, hi, I'm Torin. I'm the co-founder of the Open Policy Agent Project. Uh, I've worked on a number of policy-related features in Kubernetes and Istio and uh, other things. Um, and I'm also working for a startup called Stira, where we do dynamic least privileged auth. Hey, David Lawrence. I'm the head of security at Docker. Um, I've been there about three years and originally joined to build all of our signing infrastructure, which became Notary, which is a member of the CNCF. It's based on the work that Justin and his research team did uh, in the update framework. Um, and more recently, took over the security team at Docker and kind of playing with all of the things. It's a lot of fun. And hi, I'm Maya Kaczorowski. I'm a product manager in security at Google. I care about container security. I care extra about Kubernetes, uh, but basically touch a lot of things. I focus specifically on runtime security and secret management. Which is great. Uh, and by the way, everything we're saying in this panel is not a secret because it's being recorded. So if there's something that you want to keep secret, don't say it. Uh, that's the best way to keep a secret is not to say something. Uh, so that's just the standard kind of good security. Uh, so each, uh, the update framework, uh, notary, uh, Spiffy and OPA are all in various stages of being CNCF projects incubated or sandboxed, depending on how the terminology rolls out. Uh, Maya, of course, is at an operator, uh, which will implement perhaps some or some combination of these things. So my first question to the panelists, and we can answer in any order uh, you would like, is across all these projects, uh, so far as I'm aware, there's no SIG security. Well, there's a, there's a security response group. We'll talk about that at some other point. But there's no SIG security necessarily or an integrated reference architecture, because every project within the CNCF has its own governance model, and there is no reference architecture, uh, which may or may not be a positive thing. So uh, across the, the projects, uh, has there been any conversations at this point uh, for uh, an integration or perhaps a reference architecture? Well, uh, I, oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry. So I, I, I will say that the people across the CNCF and across the projects uh, have been communicating quite a bit and have been talking quite a bit. Um, so uh, obviously, David and I have 
have been talking and working together quite a, a long time. Um, but more recently, uh, you know, I have been working a lot uh, with members of the Spiffy community to do a security audit and have, uh, even though OPA is something recently uh, learned about, we've also had a lot of discussions about perhaps uh, further collaborations and trying to build, um, you know, a more complete and more um, uh, security audit, audited uh, framework for all Kubernetes users is, I think, an overarching goal of everyone on this panel. Yeah, and I guess another thing that's popped up uh, at the beginning of this year was the policy working group within Kubernetes. Uh, so that's looking at how mm -hmm. you can bring together a lot of the different policy, security, resource management related, related features uh, in Kubernetes to, to help people secure and manage their clusters, because right now a lot of that information is just written down somewhere and no one knows how to tie it together. Yeah, I think um, there have been a lot of conversations, but you know, the question we get a lot, I would say, is like, are there too many security companies in the space? And it's almost similar to open source projects where like, there's so many going on, there are a lot of conversations, right? Every week there's a different project popping up and it's like, oh, hey, Let's go and talk to the maintainers and see if there's something we can do with like Notary or Spiffy or, you know, more recently, like we've been looking at OPA at Docker. Um, and some of it is just like, even though there's all these conversations, at some point you have to decide like, is this the right combination of projects? Um, and there's going to be a little bit of sort of maturing and then like winnowing of projects and people will, you know, collect around the major ones. Um, and I think then we'll actually see some of these integrations come together and we'll see sort of more things that are designed to plug in together across the space. Yeah, I'll just add, so for Kubernetes, there is SIG auth. Um, I don't know if you were talking about general for CNCF, but SIG auth is really SIG security. There was a discussion like December 2016, if you look at the mailing list, about renaming it or calling a new SIG security, and then they didn't. So historical reasons, if you have security questions, SIG auth is the place to go hang out. Um, the, they do talk about like integrations with, with, other, with other CNCF projects. Um, and, and other external projects, things like Istio and how that would work together. The, the thing I would kind of push back on is, I don't know that there should be a reference implementation. So maybe if you're trying to solve a particular problem, there should be like a recommendation on how to do it or how to use various CNCF projects together. And obviously they should work well together, but everybody's environment is so different at the end of the day, right? If you don't need to solve this particular piece, then we shouldn't say that you need it. Fair enough. Uh, it, it just my perspective is there always seems to be people that like to do roll your own. And when they roll their own, they always miss something. But um, for somebody that was, uh, just to go back half a step, if somebody's running uh, Kubernetes out of the box, plain vanilla, upstream, without the benefit of Tough Notary, OPA, or Spiffy, uh, what should they really be concerned about other than, you know, being employed? <laughs> uh, something even more basic, like how did you configure Kubernetes? There's, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done from like basic security management as a, as a user. It's not very usable right now um, if you're not one of the people sitting in this room who wants to spend the time learning how community security works. We can't expect users to just go deploy it and for it to be secure. I'd, I'd second uh, what Maya said, you know, that putting, putting better locks on the door doesn't help you if you leave the door open every night. There's a, a whole set of basic concerns around Kubernetes hygiene that you, you probably want to solve, frankly, first before thinking about some of these higher level projects that, that add a lot of value, but um, not on an insecure framework. Uh, I'll, I'll give a counterpoint. Um, I think Kubernetes could do a lot more to be secure by default. Uh, I think right today, when you go and deploy Kubernetes, you have like push button insecure. Um, and for, I, mean, I think everybody's heard about it by now. There was the like, big Tesla hack a few weeks ago where somebody just deployed default Kubernetes, TCP port open to the internet, somebody scraped their AWS credentials, and now they're crypto mining under Tesla's AWS account. Um, there should be at least like a step the user has to take to configure it to be insecure, right? Just don't open a TCP socket, open a Unix socket, and then give the user a simple way to open a TCP socket, and hopefully that's enough of an extra bar. It isn't, but it's at least like one tiny additional step that they have to take, where they might think like, oh, hey, I'm, I'm opening a socket to the wider internet, maybe I should do something with that. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, and in terms of the Tesla thing, for since this is being recorded, for those of you who want to find other instances, and if you happen to be showdown users, just uh, type in Kubernetes. You'll find some stored queries that I put in there uh, a couple weeks ago. And you'll find a few others. We can't mention names uh, because that would uh, be contrary to jurisdictional laws, I believe. But uh, do a showdown query and you'll find things, uh, and you don't want to find yourself in there. Uh, smarter people than me will always tell me the first thing you should try and do is hack yourself. And if you show up in showdown, um, that's not a good thing. Um, we talked a little bit now, or Davey mentioned uh, secure by default. 
the corollary to secure by default is defense in depth. So just as a philosophical argument, uh, should a cloud native environment be uh, secure by default, defense in depth, or C all of the above, or D is none of that all possible and it's just hype that those of us in the media write about? I mean, I, I think we're seeing companies already like abandoning traditional perimeter-based security. Yeah. And so, you know, like for example, Netflix is a company that uses OPA. They, they distribute policy enforcement out to the edge because they have all these different resource types and identity providers like, you know, contractors and batch jobs and full-time employees and all these things are coming from different systems and you never really know what your service is getting accessed by. So the only place to enforce that is right at the edge. And so that's why projects like Istio are, are so powerful because you can transparently enforce policy mm -hmm. across, across all these different workloads and so on. Yeah, I, I think um, absolutely defense in depth is a key thing that should be there. Secure by default is important too. And I, I think that there is a, you know, a strong realization and a movement towards this in companies that are um, you know, security aware. I mean, actually one of the exciting technologies that I learned about coming here was the G Pfizer uh, work that's being done out of Google. And even more so than just you know, the exact work and exactly where it is today, um, hearing the discussion about things about how they have to have levels of indirection between sensitive data and user-facing uh, user code and not have you know, common vulnerabilities and issues like, um, that, that could lead to a compromise of that data, those are the types of things, those sorts of philosophies about how do we design our systems are the things that need to permeate uh, better into the community. And the more tooling and, and things we can do to make as much of it secure uh, by default and, and able to be done like that by default, the better off everyone is going to be. Yeah, there's, there's more code being deployed at higher velocity. So we're going to make more mistakes. Um, and more of that code is being deployed by computers. And computers are really good at repeating our mistakes over and over again. So secure by default is absolutely critical. Uh, I think defense in depth is getting really interesting because containers have reduced the scope of what we're trying to control. And that actually allows us to apply much more tailored sort of defense in depth policy, controls and restrictions. Um, so actually our defense in depth thing is getting better as well. Great, uh, and then since uh, I know we're talking about cloud native, we're in the cloud native Sorry. bubble. I just wanna, Andrew, did you wanna chime in on that? Only to sort of reinforce the two points, which is that uh, defense in depth and secure by default are actually pretty complementary to each other, I think. You know, if you have a robust foundation, then it becomes a lot easier to start reasoning about things like zero trust. And in fact, you have to in order to be able to do that. So I, I, I completely second the point that the, the, the two are complementary, and uh, if you get better at one, you can get better at the other. Which makes a lot of sense. Um, you, you just always hear people uh, talk about exactly perimeter security, and that would be it. But uh, since at least uh, four or five years ago, when RSA had their RSA ID breach, uh, they've been, they, they can't say that anymore. Uh, so everybody's, half my stories are always about threat hunting, uh, trying to find people after they're already in. Um, since we're in the cloud native bubble, I know we're talking all about cloud native uh, technology, certainly uh, that's exciting, but it's only been around three years. Uh, some of the projects up here have been around even less time uh, than that necessarily. Uh, where do you see the intersection between some of the, the new controls that we're talking about, whether it's Update Framework, OPA, Spiffy, the things that Google's doing, Notary, uh, and existing compensating controls that are in a, in a network, whether it's uh, uh, existing IPS technologies, firewall, perimeter stuff, other things that might sit on a host operating system or as part of a, a network uh, infrastructure? I mean, Ultimately, somebody gets into your network because of a vulnerability in some piece of software you're running. Um, apparently, a lot of compromises come from inside your network, but even if we just focus on compromises that are coming in from the outside world, uh, you still need things like intrusion detection. You still need you know, intrusion prevention and response because like, my uh, setcom policy isn't going to stop necessarily somebody coming in from outside who finds a SQL injection. Right? There's a lot of vulnerabilities that the current tools just aren't designed or tailored to handle. Yeah. Uh, and things that are doing like network packet monitoring, web application firewalls. Like I know people have different, differing opinions on those, um, but they still provide a different type of protection. Um, and they protect frequently against coding problems in your application, um, as opposed to say configuration issues, sure. uh, trust boundaries, and so on. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. I think there's a um, you know idea that containers are actually very different from VMs, and you know here's some reasons why. But there's a bunch of reasons why they're the same. And you're gonna if you have an IDS in your on-prem environment or in your VM, you need one for your container. You have a firewall before you still need a firewall. Like that doesn't go away. 
I think some of the things that do change are around this software supply chain piece, in the sense that before you had a box that you bought from some vendor and that was audited and was FIP certified and you know had you know was updated every three years and some guy showed up with a, some firmware and did some things. And now it's like, oh, there's a new dependency and I just pulled it from some GitHub repo and I pushed it into production and it happened in seconds. And like you don't really know how all that plays together. So I think we're going to have to spend a lot more time as an industry looking at all of that, which is why you see things like Tuff and Notary, which are helping to secure that aspect of it. I think as well as software supply chain, another use case that, that you know, when we talk, to, we, we talk to a lot of people about zero trust and it's actually, as often as not, it's, it's, it's operations teams that we speak to rather than security teams. And the motivation for it, uh, you know, as, as well as it providing defense in depth, is to provide better fidelity. You know, VPNs and VPCs can be, and firewalls, are, you know, can be expensive and are usually fairly coarse grained. Um, so people want higher fidelity when they um, when they're applying policy, and the uh, and so what you end up resolving to is is realizing that you need um, you know some degree of, of application-centric identity to be able to, uh, to do what you need to do. It's not necessarily because you don't, you, you suddenly don't trust your firewall anymore, it's because uh, you, you need more fidelity in your policy. So the two are complementary to a certain extent. Um, hopefully as people get more comfortable around zero trust, maybe the firewalls will start to get even more cost-grained and, uh, and even larger and become more brute force perimeters. But um, you know, there's, there's an evolution from one to the other. I also think that like for the open policy agent, and I think also Tough Notary and Spiffy, like the projects are fairly generic and pluggable. And so I think as they mature, we'll probably see them applied to like legacy systems as well. And and because that's sort of what they're designed to do as well. Like it's, it's not fundamentally different, so. Yeah, that's one of the questions I got after I actually wrote about the inclusion of um, uh, Spiffy and OPA into uh, the CNCF is, I started getting questions uh, from CISOs that I know saying, well, I already have an identity system. I already have a policy system. This is going to be more layers of abstraction in the Congo line of security controls that I already have. Uh, and then they'll always ask me, well, Sean, what's the source of truth in the single pane of glass view? So when you're talking, whether it's identity or updates uh, or even just policy, where would the source of truth be? Or is it really just a question of context? If I'm inside the container world, then it should be container native or cloud native rather versus some kind of macro enterprise uh, infrastructure view of uh, policy identity security. I'll speak from the Spiffy standpoint, which is that uh, you know the, the it, it is context sensitive, but it's it's entirely reasonable to think about um, a project like Spiffy as as something that lets you bridge, say, Active Directory yeah. or, or you know an Open ID provider to uh, you know dynamically scheduled and uh, elastically scaled you know more more uh, more ephemeral infrastructure. I think one of the things that I um, I sort of did a, a cry for help for a talk a few weeks ago. Different panel a few weeks back at the Container Security Summit with Google is like... We do a lot of panels together. Yeah. There's, um, there's an enormous wealth of data out there about what applications are doing. And a big part of policy is like, how do I lock down my application? Right? What seccom policy do I use? What app armor do I use? Uh, you know, what capabilities does it require? Um, and a lot of these applications are, you know, Apache, Nginx, MySQL, Redis, like applications that everybody is using in their vanilla form. And yet we don't have standardized policies for these things. And then you take it a step further and it's like, okay, what if it's just a PHP app running on Apache? Well, 99% of those require the same set of permissions. So I would love there to be some kind of uh, collaborative effort. And I do not know how to make this happen. So if you think you do, please come and talk to me afterwards to like pull together all of the information about you know how particular applications are running so that we can use that to assess like what should be the standard runtime security policy for nginx you know and that will benefit all of us um, i know how to make this happen you just ask people for help um, the uh, there's it's true what you're saying is completely correct i'm really frustrated that there isn't a universal policy language that applies to everything that i could possibly want to, to do like it really blows my mind that we are where we are today and that doesn't exist. You should check out OPA. Yeah, so I've, I've heard of OPA. Um, I've also heard of Sentinel from HashiCorp, which only works with their enterprise solutions. And I'm hoping that th one of those or anything else you come up with or anything else that you can think of is going to solve that. But like, I'd love it to, to get to a point where we've kind of agreed as a community that this is what we're going to do. And then please help help build whatever that's going to be and all those reference, those reference policies because we, we do need that. 
Yeah, just to argue devil's advocate, what I hear from security vendors, uh, whether it's container native, cloud native, or otherwise, is you use machine learning, so you, 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 know, you sprinkle that pixie dust out there, uh, and then you do your baseline. So you understand uh, what the uh, baseline is over a certain period of time uh, for both the entity and then the user, and then if there's deviation after that, then okay, that must be something wrong. Is that far too simplistic an approach? I think this is what I'm asking for, is like, we, we could take all of that machine learning data, but like, Getting that from one vendor, they're going to build their own set of heuristics. Um, and it might be OK, yeah. but it's not going to hit every case. So like, how do we collect all of that from everybody to build a sort of meaningful, like, you know what? There were a billion instances of Nginx run, and this was a sort of consolidated security policy that fell out of that. You, you do run into a bit of risk here with a, with a situation like that, there, where you kind of end up going down to the lowest common denominator that you know, a lot of people end up having. Um, if you have a CI CD system, then, uh, and you have everything set up so you can effectively test it as though you're in your production environment, then you have the ability to tweak the knobs. And I'd love to see tooling that would automatically try to, to tweak and configure. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> tweak and configure. <laughs> not, not, not the sound system, though. Um, Tweaking can configure uh, thing, things to try to you know, effectively maximize your, your security until you reach the point that, that you effectively have breakage in your system. Yeah, um, Netflix talks about one of the tools that they have that does this that kind of like starts from everything being open and just like, let's close it a little bit and see if anything breaks. And let's close a bit more and see if anything breaks and keeps going that way. I think that's really cool. Um, I know um, Google thinks about something similar with, like we have this concept of right sizing instances on GCE where if you're running with a VM that's bigger than we think you need, we'll tell you. And you can think about that for security too, right? like how do we tighten all those things so, hey, that looks like it's more than what you really need. You know, try right. something smaller. And, and we've been doing something similar even with um, like uh, Linux kit and other kind of like container runtimes and OS runtimes to try to see can we, can we do something clever on paths that we don't think are, are going to be needed very often by applications because when people exploit zero days, they happen to, to touch random odd parts of the kernel more often than not. Great, uh, we've got about uh, 10 or so odd minutes left uh, and I wanted to make sure if anyone had any questions. Uh, there's plenty of time, so do we have any uh, questions? No questions? If you don't, we have to ask each other questions. Well, you, you can ask each other questions, but before you start asking each other questions, I'll ask just one more, and I know we talked, oh, go ahead. Um, do we have like a relatively short window of time to get our collective act together as this technology emerges from where it is today to when we really start to see much more significant uptake, uptake and or increasing volumes, or are we already whistling past the graveyard? So the question is, do we have time before Armageddon? Uh, both in terms of adoption for cloud native structures and then before the bad guys, whoever they might be, you know, if they're in Russia or North Korea, before they decide to come after us. I, I didn't name names. I didn't, I, would, I didn't name names either. So, so I, I, I'll take a stab at this first and then other people please jump in and disagree. I think this is a great one for us to fight about. But I, I think that um, the reason... That's why I asked. Yes, and thank you. Uh, Cyber criminals are often going after targets that are fairly weak that they can monetize things out of. And while there have been obviously a lot of database and other types of breaches like this, and things like ransomware seem to be relatively effective. Um, people are going after things like Internet of Things style devices, Mirai botnet, and, and doing other things like that. So um, all these industries are trying to get their act together. I mean, we've been working with, and actually the most of the tough implementations, tough implementations are a variant uh, called Uptane that's used in the automotive space. And so the automakers have started to get their act together and we're trying to work with other communities like medical device manufacturers and um, you know, the electrical grid and others. And so whoever ends up lagging behind is you know, the, the slow animal of the pack that's gonna be eaten by the wolves. So let's hope it's not cloud. <laughs> yeah, I, it's not specifically in sort of the, the cloud environment um, but there are already containers running in a lot of places you might not expect it. Um, so, you know, we're, we're security people. Like, yes, we're going to tell you we need to get our act together. Um, but there are a lot of people out there, you know, to be kind to the operations community who work very hard and are on call. Um, there are a lot of people out there doing a really good job. Um, and there are a lot of container systems out there, both in the cloud and running on edge devices and IoT devices, that aren't getting compromised daily. 
Like they've, they've taken good security measures. Um, so there's a lot more we can do, and I think a lot of what we want to do is to make it easier. Um, you know, we've talked about having more secure defaults, um, and the simpler we can make security, the better we're going to scale, and the faster we're going to be able to scale. Um, but I don't think we're at like imminent danger of you know the entire container ecosystem collapsing from some security flaw. Yeah, I'll talk about Kubernetes more specifically. Um, if you look at where we were a year ago, like RBAC was released in 1.6. Explain to me how we got to 1.6 without our pack. <laughs> like, I don't understand. Um, and we're in 1.10 now, and, and things are better, but things are still far from being like amazing security. Um, the, the, the reality is people are already using it in critical systems. People um, want security, they're asking for features, and, and the community is building it and rallying behind it. And the growth of the community versus the growth of the security folks in the community has been, like, we've seen a huge, a huge uptake. Um, so, so one, we're going to see a lot more security features. Three different people said on, on stage during their keynotes, this is a year of security for, for this community, which is great. Um, I don't think we're, where, we, where we aren't yet, but people are starting to think about, is building Kubernetes to be so resilient. And, and it's not just security, but reliability, um, performance, et cetera, et cetera. That imagine that in five years from now, you're going to have a critical hospital system, a critical telco system, some sort of critical infrastructure running on Kubernetes. Like people are like, oh, that's never gonna happen. We're building a whole new infrastructure that's gonna happen. And so thinking about that when we contribute to those projects, thinking about making resilient to those types of scenarios is, is gonna be much harder, but also way more interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's actually, like less, it's less of a technology problem and more of like a cultural thing in a lot of places. So, um, you know, there are a lot of companies that are very security focused and they leverage very sophisticated, fine-grained security features in like cloud-native technology that exists today. Um, and so, like, but there, of course, there are always going to be companies that fall back to tribal knowledge and spreadsheets and wikis to keep track of things and enforce things, and that's going to give them no guarantee. But it's largely cultural. Like those companies either need to make the shift or, or not. And, and you've got to put it in context as well, right? I mean, the, we, we, we're so much better off now. You could argue. Um, than we were three or four years ago. You know, we have a standard way of packaging now, for the most part. We have a standard way of deploying. Um, we start to have standard ways of signing and standard ways of issuing identity. As you, we're now in a position where we can actually talk about software supply chain that would work for n customers and not work for one. Um, we're starting to talk about libraries and design patterns and and, and schemas that we can we can reason about. Um, we weren't even in a position to start having those conversations a few years ago. So, um, you know, it's. We, we, maybe we're understanding our own flaws a bit better, but uh, and there's maybe more at stake than there was a decade ago or two decades ago. But uh, to my mind, things are so much better now. The primitives that we have and the standards that we have and the agreements that we have, um, uh, we're, we're in a much we're in, we're in a place to actually start to do something now. Makes sense, uh, and I couldn't agree more uh, with what uh, Mayo was saying on the RBAC, and I wrote about that uh, a lot. And I think there's still another missing piece, which is uh, TLS Bootstrap, which still isn't in. Uh, but that's you can look that up. Go ahead. What's your question? So the question is, there's a, a fast pace of new projects coming in, uh, which uh, expands the attack surface, as it were. Uh, are we moving too fast? S security people tend to be a little bit like sadistic, right? Like every, if everything goes well, you get no credit, and everything goes badly, like you feel a lot of pain. And um, I, I don't think we can stop people from developing faster, and I don't think we want them to. Um, first of all, some of them are working on security features, which is great. Uh, but but in general, like us all moving towards more of a of a, um, I looked I looked at the the talk that FT gave yesterday and talked about how much time and money they saved by moving to Kubernetes. And for me, that was like just like eye opening to say I can take ten devs that I had working on something super custom in my environment, and then I can put that into a pool of thousands of devs and get back way more than ten people put in. Um, and we're going to see that with all these projects too, right? Like if I can get a few people who work on a security feature to benefit a lot of people, 
like we've done with like OpenSSL and OpenVPN and a ton of other projects out there in security, that's great. I think as well, you know, the CNCF itself, uh, one of the big things they did earlier this year was start to, uh, was to refine and, and, and perhaps more strictly enforce their, what they call their graduation okay. criteria. Um, and so you now have something of a funnel where at the one end of the funnel or before you get into that funnel, it looks a bit more like a bazaar than a cathedral. Um, there's a lot of projects and a lot going on, but uh, you know, the, the CNCF has done a lot of good work, I think, to start to create a framework that you know, operations teams and, and security teams and, and organizations in general can use to reason about you know, the degree of maturity and the degree of, degree of operational readiness, um, the, the amount of, based on the amount of real world use and you know, resiliency and, uh, um, and degree of secure defaults that exist. Uh, there's a framework now to start to reason about how mature some of these things are and how well they play together. Um, and you know, hopefully we'll see that, that continue over the next few years and um, that'll help folks make informed decisions out of all of this exciting but often mysterious work. You're actually the first person I've heard all week to mention the cathedral in this bazaar. That wasn't on the bingo chart, was it? Uh, in the old days at open source conferences, you'd always have that, you know, uh, cathedral in the bazaar, all bugs are shallow with many eyes, all those kinds of standard things. So congrats. You, first of the week. So um, I think one of the interesting things, like, you know, CNCF is not just giving us this framework, but it's actually giving the project support. Um, so one of the interesting things, I don't know what scale they're doing it, but they're actually starting to offer security audits to some of the members. Um, so, you know, as a, as a foundation and as a community, um, there is support there and there is an active effort to ensure the security of projects that have at least graduated to some level of maturity. Um, and that will, that will help with some of the sort of, you know, security issues that might otherwise arise. The other thing I'd like to do, and I don't know how to do this, so maybe some of you do, um, I'd love to see more security projects in the CNCF, right? It's, it's not necessarily specifically a, pro a home for security projects, but it's a good home for security projects, right? We have um, Spiffy and OPA, and we have Notary and Tough, but like there's lots of projects out there that don't have a particular foundation or that they're associated with in security and would hugely benefit our space. Right? We should be welcoming those people in with open arms because they're going to take their knowledge and spread it everywhere. And that's going to be good for all of us. The Linux Foundation does have uh, CII, which is kind of uh, missionless at the current point in time. But uh, that's neither here nor there. What's your question? Yeah, it's actually referring to you. Um, securities or money involved in that because people want to pay for security, right? So maybe that's why we're not seeing that many contributions to it. But going back to what you're talking about, making more secure images and manifest and so on. Right now we have, for instance, uh, Red Hat and Bitnami, uh, JFrog stuff. They are getting money for, for scanning images and scanning stuff. And do you see that it's realistic to make that open source, to make a community building stuff that can make this secure? Because there's so many much money in this. Yeah, so, so the question is, uh, there are commercial enterprises that are selling commercial services for scanning and security. Is there a business case for it to be open source first? I mean, everything eventually gets commoditized. Yeah, but so. this is going the other way now. We're right. Going to I'm saying, I don't know that there is a uh, long-term sustainable competitive advantage in that business model. And so is it crazy for a bunch of people in this room to get together and say, we're going to do this for free for the community? No, it's not crazy. And I mean, look at Kubernetes. <laughs> I'll speak to the other sort of part of that question, which was about, um, you know, getting more sort of, I guess, com contributors and involvement in security projects. Um, I think Justin and I did a, a deep dive for the notary and tough projects this morning. And at the end, the very first question was like, I'm not a crypto expert. How do I get involved with these projects? Um, so I think a lot of times security projects can be intimidating. Um, but ultimately, like a lot of what we're working on isn't crypto. People shouldn't associate security equals crypto. Um, you know, I didn't write my own crypto for notary. I, I leveraged the libraries that already exist in Go. Um, and, you know, I can make sure that somebody who wants to get into it can not sort of screw up the configuration piece of that crypto. Um, so I think there is some outreach to be done there. Like, you know, let people know that, hey, the security community isn't that big and scary, which maybe it can seem at times. Um, and I actually think uh, Kubernetes and Docker and all of the sort of open source that sprung up around containers is actually making a lot of security more welcoming. Um, I think it's actually becoming less intimidating, or at least that's my impression. Yeah, so even if you can't contribute like a new security project to the CNCF, there are a bunch of working groups and SIGs, like SIG Auth, 
which deals with Kubernetes. There's the policy working group in Kubernetes. There's the safe working group that's popping up in CNCF. Um, and all of these things are dealing with security. I might probably miss some, but uh, all of these things are, are dealing with, with security. So um, you can come and contribute to that, that community and that discussion. And for non-developers, I mean, like, I'd love anybody to write docs, blog posts, talk about these things, tell us what your feature needs are, all of that, right? Yeah, bring your use cases. You know, of all of the working, most of the working groups that uh, I've, I've been in or, or sat, been a fly on the wall for, the, the word that keeps coming up again and again is not crypto or elliptic curves, it's, it's usability. It's how can I reason about this? How can I explain it? How can I rationalize about how I, what happens when I make a change? Um, it's, it's, it's usability first and foremost, and that, you know, improving that it seems to be, you know, while I'm throwing around buzzwords, seems to be the, uh, the, well you know, the, 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 highest, um, the highest return on investment that we can make as a community. And that doesn't need um, uh, perhaps the traditional set of security skills. It's a good place to end, because uh, I couldn't agree more. If uh, security isn't usable and nobody uses it, you have a door that has a door lock, but you don't lock the door because you don't know how to lock it, <laughs> you got nothing. Uh, that's uh, 5 o'clock, so that's the end of our panel. So if you could all join me in thanking our panelists. And thank you for coming to KubeCon. <laughs>